By 476, the Roman Empire had vanished from Western Europe. By 655, the Persian Empire had vanished from the Near East. It is only too easy to write about the late antique world as if it were merely a melancholy tale of decline and fall, of the end of the Roman Empire as viewed from the West, of the Persian Sasanian Empire as viewed from Iran. On the other hand, we are increasingly aware of the astounding new beginnings associated with this period. We go to it to discover why Europe became Christian and why the Near East became Muslim. We have become extremely sensitive to the contemporary quality of the new, abstract art of this age. The writings of men like Plotinus and Augustine surprise us as we catch strains, as in some unaccustomed overture, of so much that a sensitive European has come to regard as most modern and valuable in his own culture. Looking at the late antique world, we are caught between the regretful contemplation of ancient ruins and the excited acclamation of new growth. What we often lack is a sense of what it was like to live in that world. Like many contemporaries of the changes we shall read about, we become either extreme conservatives or hysterical radicals. A Roman senator could write as if he still lived in the days of Augustus and wake up, as many did at the end of the 5th century AD, to realize that there was no longer a Roman emperor in Italy. Again, a Christian bishop might welcome the disasters of the barbarian invasions as if they had turned men irrevocably from earthly civilization to the heavenly Jerusalem, yet he will do this in a Latin or Greek unselfconsciously modeled on the ancient classics, and he will betray attitudes to the universe, prejudices, and patterns of behavior that marked him out as a man still firmly rooted in 800 years of Mediterranean life. With these words, Peter Brown opened up his 1971 work, The World of Late Antiquity, and in doing so, he shattered conceptions about the late Roman Empire and created an entirely new subfield of history. That field is late antiquity, and it is very much concerned with the Roman Empire between about 300 and 800, give or take a century or two. Peter Brown and his followers have provided a new way of understanding this period, one that wasn't really considered before 1971. So, what was different? Well, if there's one thing everyone knows about the Roman Empire, it's that it fell. This is probably the best-known fact about ancient history. And if there's one other thing everyone knows about the Roman Empire, it's that that fall isn't really all that surprising. After all, the late Roman Empire was a state that was in a continual condition of decline and rot. And if there's a third thing everyone knows about the Roman Empire, it's that barbarians had something to do with it. Now, if you're not familiar with this, then let's cut right to it. The concept of the Roman Empire as a state that declined and fell is one that sits in the long shadow of a short man, Edward Gibbon. Gibbon was an intellectual giant who lived in a world of intellectual giants. He was born in Great Britain, and he grew up during the 18th century Enlightenment. Because he was an aristocrat, he went on a grand tour, something undertaken by 18th century European aristocrats, where time was spent traveling Europe and becoming acquainted with the places that their classical education had introduced them to. While in Rome, Gibbon was very much struck by the ruins of the city, and he resolved to write the history of the end of the Roman Empire. The history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire is a gigantic work, and nothing like it has really ever been attempted since by a single author. It spans six volumes and covers the history of the Roman Empire from the years 98 to about 1500, and Gibbon's overall thesis is that the empire collapsed due to the influx of Christianity, causing moral weakness and a disdain for fighting, severely weakened the state, and then that weakened state was overwhelmed by hordes of barbarians. The Eastern Empire then limped on for a few more centuries before finally being overwhelmed by the Ottomans in 1453. The influence of the book has been massive, and it's now regarded as a piece of classic English literature, and historians have been impacted by it for generations. Despite John Burry's history of the later Roman Empire focusing on the Eastern Mediterranean, his work still followed in the footsteps of Gibbon because while it does emphasize political continuity into the Eastern Roman Empire, it doesn't have an overall emphasis on cultural continuity. This changes in 1971. In that year, Peter Brown was asked to write an introductory history of the late Roman Empire, and the book he produced, The World of Late Antiquity, smashed the concept of decline and fall forever. Brown argued that although the Roman Empire did indeed have some serious issues, they weren't anything that the state hadn't faced before, 
And despite these issues, if we look closely, what we really see is not decline, but new, wonderful cultural growth. Late Antiquity as a Field was born with the publication of this book. So let's take a look at that new growth that he's talking about. This field of study is very much focused on the Mediterranean, and it also encompasses the Near East and a portion of North Africa. There are some late antique scholars who focus on Western Europe, but in general, this is the geographic focus for the experts. One of the big things it's concerned with is the growth of Christianity, and then eventually of Islam. The sheer volume of source material on these subjects is daunting, and in many ways it defies any attempt at coherent organization. The primary source material is stunning in its linguistic diversity. Latin, Greek, and the local dialects of both languages, Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, Coptic, Punic, Macedonian, although whether that should be considered its own tongue or just a dialect of Greek is disputed, with the majority of scholars coming down on the side that it was a version of Greek. Indeed, many speakers of modern Greek can read these ancient Macedonian texts, as well as the numerous other tongues spoken in the Persian Empire in what eventually becomes known as the Arabian Peninsula. Now, this is not to say that there isn't any linguistic diversity in other places in the empire. It's just that there are more in this general region, and the sources that survive are more numerous, so we simply have more to work with. These sources inform us that people who lived in the late Roman Empire were, in many ways, beginning to become preoccupied with the afterlife in certain respects that they had not been concerned with before. There was a preoccupation with the soul and what happens to it after death, and the preoccupation with the afterlife becomes reflected in art, with numerous statues being carved with their eyes gazing upwards toward heaven. There was also the rise of what we would consider to be holy people, men and women connected to God in a way that the average person cannot fully comprehend, but they comprehend that connection enough to understand that there is something very mystical about them, powerful even. These holy people intercede on behalf of the non-holy, in both the spiritual sense and in the physical sense. In terms of spiritual intervention, monasteries, these places out in the Egyptian deserts where people went to become ascetics, those withdrawn from society, were on the rise. And in these monasteries, monks literally believed that they were wrestling with demons and evil spirits for the protection of others. The language used in the sources is wrestling language, telling us that the monks fought demons, stamped their feet in the dirt, and cast them out of the ring. In terms of physical intervention, there were cases where monks would block the roads when soldiers would come knocking for tax money. The Syrian monks in particular carved crosses into their foreheads, and actions like this very much frighten the soldiers. Christianity is a faith that is disunited when it begins its spread across Eurasia, and various forms of it take hold in a broad arc from Ireland to China, although it doesn't extend very far into the regions dominated by nomadic societies. What late antiquity is concerned with, though, is church councils which attempt to come to some sort of conclusion on problems that existed in Christianity at the time. Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. So, was he fully human, or part human? If he was part human, how could he be God? Was God a separate entity? The particular forms of Christianity that result from these councils, and which eventually take hold in the Roman Empire, eventually become Roman Catholicism and Greek Orthodoxy, which help unite early medieval Europe. It is also concerned with the development of Islam and its spread. Neither of these focuses are necessarily on the military or political aspects of these expansions, generally speaking. Instead, the focus of research is really on the development of monasteries and the intellectual culture of these new faiths, in addition to the continuance of Judaism. During the late Roman Empire, especially after the reforms of Diocletian, but even earlier during the era of Aurelian, we see a general transformation of upper-class Roman society. If class is even the correct way to think about it, there were some issues with putting it like that. Education had always been important as a marker of social distinction for the Roman elite, but in late antiquity, its role becomes more and more important as the Western Empire breaks up politically. An education for the Roman aristocracy was based around what we would understand to be the classics. You would have been expected to have a working knowledge of Greek, the more fluent you were the better, and you were expected to know Latin. But when you spoke or wrote those languages, you were expected to show your command of diction and syntax, and thus what you were talking about was unintelligible to someone who is not privy to that education. Late Roman historians and early Byzantine historians consciously emulated older writers like Thucydides 
so those works were expected to have allusions to even older events. Like, for example, there's an argument, and my understanding is that this is largely accepted, that the way the Battle of the Catalonian Fields, where Aetius and Attila's armies fought each other in 451, was written in such a way as to have it mirror the Battle of Marathon. You would also be expected to quote the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid in conversation. As the Roman government expanded to include more people in the late antique world, though, education becomes more widely available, and because of that, the upper echelon of Roman society sought ways to distinguish themselves more and more from the lower classes, and the end result is that many of them begin to turn to monasticism, and they become monks. Many of them become sought after because they possess knowledge of languages like Hebrew, which are instrumental in studying scripture. The need for an education that set the upper classes apart was also necessary because this was how the men in this chunk of society defined masculinity. And by the way, I'm drawing on Paul Vane's History of Private Life for this section of the video, particularly Chapter 2, which focuses on late antiquity, and Chapter 4, which focuses on the early medieval period. So, masculinity for upper-class men had a few characteristics. Who you slept with didn't matter. What mattered was that during sexual intercourse, you had to be the one in the dominant role. If you were on the receiving end, then you were effeminate. What you looked like, though, mattered very much. Late antique aristocratic men were expected to be toned and slightly muscular, but not too much, otherwise it could be inferred that you did manual labor. Going off of this, Service in the military was something that wasn't done too often. Now we're going to come back to this in a moment, but we need to talk more about education first. Aristocratic men were expected not to look too muscular because they weren't supposed to be doing outside work. Their education was expected to be top-notch, better than anyone else's, because they were expected to use that education and their wealth in the pursuit of otium, a word meaning something like cultured leisure. It was the pursuit of scholarship, more or less, and doing activities related to it was how males in the Roman aristocracy helped define masculinity. Late antiquity also focuses on how that definition began to change as the Western Roman Empire fell apart. The Germanic groups that were migrating into the Roman provinces saw manhood as something very much attached to military matters and to war, and as the political landscape changed in places like Britain and Gaul, the archaeological sites changed in composition as regards aristocratic burials. What we start to see in the archaeology is a rise of weapons deposited as grave goods, and what we can infer from this is that since there was no longer an empire in the west, aristocrats have to start adjusting themselves to local conditions, and because of this, the overall way that people in this era understood gender roles, what each sex is supposed to do, undergoes a transformation. Going along with this change in religion and social norms, late antiquity also examines the material changes in architecture, and the overall structures of cities. Doing anything with statistics in the ancient world is extremely difficult, but we have enough archaeological work done to infer that, in general, the overall size of cities in many areas begin to shrink, while the general size of cities in the Eastern Empire remains somewhat constant, and in some cases, actually expands. So there is a contrast here between East and West. Monks in the Egyptian desert believed that pain brought them closer to God, and in worshipping Christ, they would often kneel on sharp rocks and cut their palms to stain the walls of their caves with crosses made from their blood. One of the disciples of St. Anthony the Great, a man named Marcarius, according to the traditional story, smacked a mosquito as it was feeding on him and felt so awful that he journeyed into a swamp and for six months stayed there and allowed himself to be eaten by the mosquitoes. Asceticism like this continued all throughout late antiquity, but as Christianity spread through the Roman world, what happens is that Christianity in some ways gets split in half. On the one hand, you have that extreme asceticism, but on the other hand, you have what Ramsay Macmullen has called popular Christianity. This refers to the rise and function of holy men and saints in popular culture, the worship of relics, things of that nature. The growth that's happening across these cities and towns come in the form of popular Christianity. Older structures are torn down and rebuilt or just repurposed into new churches, and the towns and the cities begin to reorganize themselves around these structures. This trend is going to continue all across the former Roman Empire until about the 1250s when a new form of town structure, the Bastide Town, is developed in France, whose central focus is on the market, not the church. 
This general breakdown and restructuring of civic life and civic affairs is resisted to a greater degree in the Eastern Empire up until about the 7th and the 8th centuries, when a multitude of factors forced the populations of Greece and Anatolia to move from cities to more defensible hills and mountains. This movement is not across the board, of course, but you get the idea. Lastly, late antiquity is very much focused on the Eastern Roman Empire, what some call the Byzantine Empire. There's way too much to talk about concerning the state to fit into an introductory video, but I just want to mention it before I close. So that's it for now. I certainly hope you enjoyed this introductory video, and as always, if you have questions, you know where to find me.